Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on therapeutic approaches for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. This activity is jointly provided by National Jewish Health and Bonham CE, and this program is supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences. If you haven't already completed your pre-survey, please do so by clicking the link below this video or by scanning the QR code shown here. And please be sure to complete your evaluation at the end of the session and claim your CME credits. Be sure to watch our handles for additional COVID-19 CE programming and follow Bonham CE for more CME certified programs on Twitter. Before we get started, please let us know who you are in the polling questions on the screen. So I'm Dr. Nita Kadir. I am an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care at UCLA. And I am joined today by my two colleagues. First, we'll start with Dr. Charlie Ray. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Charlie Ray. I'm a hospitalist and health services researcher at the San Francisco VA and the University of California, San Francisco. I'll pass the torch over to Dr. Obuagu. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Anyema Obuagu. I'm an associate professor of infectious disease and the director of antivirals and vaccines research program at the Yale School of Medicine. Our faculty disclosures can be seen on the screen. Our learning objectives today are to review and understand the evidence basis for updated guidance on COVID-19 therapeutics, select appropriate treatment regimens based on the severity of COVID-19 illness, relate the significance of high plasma viral loads to disease severity and patient outcomes, and to recognize gaps and unmet needs within current treatments, treatment approaches, and emerging therapies for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So let's kick things off with a clinical case. Thanks, Nita. Uh, so let me tell you guys about a patient. I've seen this gentleman many a times um, before, but let's go over him real quickly. So this is a 67-year-old gentleman. He's got a history of smoking, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. And he comes in with a dry cough and a fever of 101 degrees. And he's complaining of fatigue, uh, but that's basically about it. We put the O2 monitor on him. We see that he's satting a 99% on room air with no real shortness of breath. But of course, we test him in this day and age, and we find that he is positive for coronavirus. So let's jump into current treatments of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Now, we've all been, I think, very aware of the different treatment regimens that have occurred over the past several years. Despite vaccine development and the availability of new therapies over the past several years, there still remain lots of risk for patients with COVID-19. Morbidity or mortality still remain quite high for hospitalized patients. Recent studies have shown that COVID-19 mortality rates in older individuals is still much higher than the common flu. So something that we do have to think about when we see our older patients. We also have to think about the severe disease that is oftentimes associated with COVID-19. Things like ARDS and septic shock are still common in our patients who get quite sick with COVID. The other thing is we have to know is that hospitalized patients are at risk for other complications, things like nosocomial infections, DVT clots, and other secondary bacterial infections. So these are issues that we're always thinking about with COVID-19 patients. But let's sort of jump in and think about how we might want to think about framing them and, and how we might think about the hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patient. Now, oftentimes, the clinical course is very much based on the severity of the illness. Now, we've talked about a few of these things already. Patients with hypoxic respiratory failure, or ARDS, be very cognizant of. Patients with septic shock, as many of us know, the idea of inflammatory cytokines being elevated is an issue that we're, we're always thinking about in these patients, and many of our therapeutics will target this. The other things we can't forget about are the complications from prolonged hospitalization. And finally, as a hospitalist, I'm oftentimes thinking about how am I managing the underlying comorbid conditions that these patients are also affected by. In many of our patients, we risk stratify, right? We're all very familiar with that term. So let's think about some of the risk stratification factors that we use in patients with COVID-19. We're probably familiar with a lot of these here. I've already mentioned older age being at higher risk. Race and ethnicity are also impactful as well. Patients with smoking history, patients with many comorbid conditions. I've got several of these listed here on the right. Things like asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease. Patients with chronic kidney, liver, and lung disease are also at higher risk as well. Patients with diabetes and obesity too 
lots of data showing that these individuals are at much higher risk for poorer outcomes. Patients who are pregnant, who are on immunosuppressive drugs, and of course the unvaccinated are certainly at much higher risk for poor clinical outcomes if they should acquire COVID-19. Let's shift gears a little bit and think about how we could potentially categorize a patient who was recently diagnosed with COVID-19. Now we have these five different stages of illness that oftentimes help direct our therapeutics and where a patient is actually ending up in the hospital. Let's walk through these quickly. Of course, we have our asymptomatic and our presymptomatic infections, and these are the individuals who have a positive COVID-19 test, but have no symptoms. Next, we have patients who we classify as mild disease, individuals who have a cough, fever, malaise, but they lack shortness of breath, and their chest imaging, if they had even received any, was probably normal. Going a little bit further, we get into patients with moderate disease. Again, individuals who are presenting with these upper respiratory symptoms, cough and fever, but who also have oxygen saturations that are a little bit lower than normal. You can think of a nice cutoff point of around 94% on room air. Next, we shift gears into the more severe categories, such as those with severe illness and critical illness. And these really are defined by individuals who have low oxygen, but high oxygen requirements, as evidenced by an SpO2 of generally less than 94% on room air, or a PAFI, a PAFIO2 ratio less than 300, or an individual who's got high respiratory rates. If someone has greater than 30 breaths per minute, I'm probably pretty worried about that individual. And finally, an individual with critical illness, these are individuals who are in respiratory failure, full septic shock, and are needing mechanical ventilatory support. So team, as I bring this case back to you all, we have a 67-year-old male, again, with history of smoking, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. He's got a dry cough and, again, a mild fever at 101 and a little bit of fatigue. Positive COVID-19 test, but his O2 sats are fine on room air. What disease states would you put this patient in? And what tests might we order? So I will say that as an intensivist, I'm very pleased that you don't need my services for this gentleman yet. Uh, I would classify him as mild. However, he would be on my radar because he does have some risk factors for progression. So his age, the fact that he's a former smoker, um, has diabetes, um, I, well, I'm again, I'm pleased you don't need my my ICU services yet. I would not be surprised if you end up having to call me back uh, later during his course. Yeah, great, great pickup, uh, Neda. Uh, I, I have the same concerns as you do. I think he looks stable as of right now. And I hope I don't have to call you on this gentleman. But nonetheless, he does have some risk factors that are certainly concerning for me. Well, let's move on a little bit, and let's actually talk about how we might treat some of these different patients as we sort of move forward. And so let's dive into the current guidelines. There are two primary sources of guidelines that I think most clinicians can obtain at this point in time, one from the WHO and the other from the NIH. We're gonna really focus our discussions today around the NIH-based guidelines, but please recognize that if you're practicing in a resource-restricted area, that the WHO guidelines may be a little bit more applicable for you as well. The other thing that many of us are probably aware of is these are very much living documents. Uh, these have changed dramatically and very quickly over the past several years. And so these are things that you should probably be reviewing on a fairly regular basis if you're taking care of a high volume of COVID-19 patients at this point in time. So let's talk a little bit about the NIH guidelines and the therapeutic management of a hospitalized patient with COVID-19. Now we just reviewed the different categories of patients based on their disease severity. Again, focusing on those with mild, moderate, and severe and critical illness. Now, because we're focusing on hospitalized patients, let's first start with patients with mild disease severity. And these individuals, as many of you will probably already know, the first line medication we're gonna go to is remdesivir, indicated here by RDV. We're most likely not gonna use dexamethasone in these folks and hope that remdesivir can sort of get them over that early hump. Now, if a patient should then change classification and end up having moderate COVID-19, our antiviral therapies shift a little bit. We're certainly going to keep the remdesivir on board, but if their O2 requirements should be increasing, we're certainly going to think very quickly about adding on a corticosteroid. And the most common one we're using right now is dexamethasone. If we continue to see oxygen saturations dropping and increasing needs for O2 support, we're starting to think about our immunomodulator therapies baricitinib, and tocilizumab as well. And finally, in our patients with severe and critical COVID-19, 
these individuals who are needing that oxygen support through high flow nasal cannula, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO, we're certainly the first line medication that we're really pulling on right now is again dexamethasone, in addition to the immunomodulator therapies of baricitinib and tocilizumab as well. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the anticoagulation protocols in each one of these patients. Now, the vast majority of these folks, as you can see here on the slide, are going to receive some prophylactic dose of heparin due to that increased risk of thromboembolic states in these folks. But I do want to point out that the NIH guidelines do highlight that in patients with moderate disease, we should be considering the use of therapeutic doses of heparin, especially if the D-dimer is greater than the upper limit of normal. So knowing that nuance, I think, is really important and something we should think about. Now, what I want to do now is pass the baton over to Onima, and I want him to talk about the trials that underlie some of the treatments that we're currently using right now. Yeah, thank you for the excellent summary, Dr. Ray, and you're absolutely right that uh, these therapies were informed by, you know, clinical trial data. And so let's discuss what is the current state of care of treatment of hospitalized patients with COVID-19, and we'll be reviewing some of the key treatments that are approved by the FDA, as well as some of the key trials that led to either their authorization and or approval. So these are the current drugs that are approved by the FDA for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Through the mechanism that allowed breakthrough therapies to be used very early on for COVID-19, the emergency use authorization mechanism, but these compounds have met the bar of full FDA approval for COVID-19. And so this is the top of the pyramid, if you will, of agents that have made it thus far. Here we have a table that shows therapeutic agents, their formulation, and also pay attention to the specific indications for hospitalized patients. As we advance therapies for COVID-19, we learned to ask very important questions as to what time during the course of illness therapeutic was best used, what patient populations, and at what point in their illness should those um, uh, therapeutics be used. So let's start with remdesivir. Remdesivir exists as an intravenous formulation. It is a nucleotide analog, and it interrupts replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus using two different mechanisms of action. It is indicated for adults and later extended to pediatric patients who are older than 28 days of age and weigh at least three kilograms. It's meant to be used for at least five days or until hospital discharge. And in some individuals who do not respond to five days of therapy, there's room to extend therapy to 10 days. Baricitinib is an oral genus kinase inhibitor that was evaluated in people who are having rapid progression in their COVID-19. And so the indication is for adults with escalating O2 requirements in spite of being placed on steroids in addition to ventilatory support and oxygen support modalities. And it's indicated for individuals to be used within 96 hours of hospitalization. This medication may be used in combination with dexamethasone or equivalent dose uh, corticosteroids and those dependent on estimated GFR of the individuals. Whereas sitinib may be used up to 14 days, but you may discharge a patient who improves and terminates the therapy prematurely. We also have tocilizumab, which is an intravenous interleukin-6 inhibitor. Again, the indication for this is for hospitalized patients who are also receiving systemic corticosteroids and require supplemental oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, mechanical ventilation, or an ECMO. The dose is as shown, and individuals can receive a first infusion with space for a second infusion following that. Also, dexamethasone, those that six milligrams daily, can also be administered for 10 days for individuals who require supplemental oxygen. I frequently tell providers oxygen equals dexamethasone when it comes to COVID-19 therapy. Now, here are some of the pivotal clinical trials for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. I like the ACT-1 trial, for example, because this was one of the very early randomized controlled trials for COVID-19 therapies, and it actually happened in an era where there were no authorized or approved therapies. So in this study, they evaluated people to be treated with COVID-19 across the spectrum of severity to receive remdesivir or placebo. And in this study, there were about 1,000 patients randomized in the trial, and the primary endpoint was time to recovery. And as you can see in the results, that remdesivir resulted in a faster time to recovery than placebo by difference of five days. And individuals in the remdesivir arm were also more likely to have numerically lower mortality rate, however, didn't meet statistical significance by day 29. 
There were also additional studies that evaluated remdesivir for five days versus a 10-day course or compared to standard of care in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomized design. And the endpoint here also was the odds of clinical improvement by day 11 post-treatment initiation. And in this study, they found that those who were randomized to the five-day remdesivir arm had significantly higher odds of a better clinical status by that time point compared to those who received standard of care. However, that difference was not seen in those who received remdesivir for 10 days compared to standard of care. Additional trials have also been helpful in uh, assessing therapies for efficacy for COVID-19. The Carve Barrier study looked at baricitinib, and this was a study that looked at baricitinib versus standard of care. And at this time, individuals were receiving drugs like corticosteroids and remdesivir. In spite of this, in this study, they found a significant mortality reduction in individuals who were in the baricitinib group compared to placebo with the hazard ratio as shown. The IMPACTA study also evaluated tocilizumab, a two-to-one randomized control study design in hospitalized patients who were not receiving mechanical ventilation. And interestingly, the population in the trial included high-risk and minority populations. So in hospitalized patients who were not receiving mechanical ventilation, tocilizumab reduced the likelihood of progressing to needing mechanical ventilation or death, the composite outcome. However, that was mostly driven by decreasing progression to mechanical ventilation. It did not improve survival. The REMCAP study also evaluated tocilizumab and found improved outcomes, particularly among critical and critically ill patients receiving some form of organ support in the ICU. The recovery trial was a large platform study that evaluated dexamethasone for COVID-19, and this was done with control arms in an open-label fashion with a large sample size of over 6,000 individuals. In this study, it found that dexamethasone reduced 28-day mortality among those who are receiving mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization. Important to note that this benefit was not seen in individuals who did not require oxygen support. The active four inpatient study was an NIH-sponsored COVID-19 trial that evaluated the safety and effectiveness of varying doses of heparin and blood thinners given up to 14 days to prevent or reduce the formation of blood clots and improve outcomes in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Full-dose heparin reduced the need for organ support in moderately ill COVID-19 patients, but not critically ill patients. However, in this trial, lack of efficacy was demonstrated for crizanlizumab, as well as also other P2Y12 inhibitors and prophylactic heparin. And a very astute comment was that these results certainly made for a compelling example of how important it is to stratify patients with different disease severity in clinical trials, because we do know, as studies have shown, that while one sort of group of patients may benefit from an intervention, the same intervention may be harmful in others. The active 5 BET, the big effect trial, was an inpatient trial that evaluated whether certain approved therapies or investigational drugs in late stage clinical development showed promise against COVID-19 in hospitalized patients. This included patients like ivory resankizumab, which is approved for sickle cell disease, in addition to remdesivir. Lenzilumab also was assessed, which is a GMCSF monoclonal antibody, Aramdesivir and oral danicopan also were evaluated for COVID-19. While we still await the results for the other two agents, no efficacy was shown for lenzilumab. Again, this study, among others, also helped streamline a pathway through efficient study design to really identify therapies that provide clinical benefit for patients. Now, here are additional agents that have received emergency use authorization for hospitalized COVID-19 patients, but have not quite achieved approval yet. So these include the recently authorized anti-C5A monoclonal antibody velobelumab, which in clinical trials has shown improved survival rates in individuals who were mechanically ventilated with COVID-19 and led to significant reductions in mortality. And this was quite remarkable for a very sick population who were on mechanical ventilation as one of the study entry criteria. Currently, while there are multiple antivirals approved for outpatient use, we know that none of these has quite achieved authorization for hospitalized patients, and studies are ongoing to evaluate antiviral agents for hospitalized patients in clinical trials.
We also know that there are multiple immune modulators as well that have shown promise for COVID-19, including varsitinib and tocilizumab, which have been approved in adults and also being evaluated in children, as well as anacumra, which is an IL-1 antagonist as well for hospitalized patients. And, you know, these are um, agents that are able to suppress a specific uh, immune responses that can be deleterious for individuals with severe COVID-19 and lead to more uh, severe outcomes. Unfortunately, um, we've seen some agents fall out of use, and these are the monoclonal antibodies due to just the evolving variants over time to which the circulating variants were no longer susceptible to them. And so for now, unfortunately, there are no active emergency use authorization for SARS-CoV-2 directed monoclonal antibodies, and we're all waiting for the next generation of monoclonal antibodies that may have benefit against emerging variants. What a fantastic review, Dr. Obuago. Let's bring it back to our case here. So we've got our 67-year-old male here, again, with multiple comorbid conditions. We tested positive for COVID-19. Initially, just that fever, dry cough was doing okay. We were watching him down in the emergency room. But his oxygen saturation continued to drop. He's got 82% on room air now. He's having more and more difficulty breathing. We start him on high-flow nasal cannula, pretty high rate of 40 liters at 40% in the emergency department. And that improved his oxygen saturations up to 95%. It's got an elevated white count. CRP is elevated at 25. We've got that chest X-ray back that shows some bilateral pacifications and infiltrates on his chest X-ray. Dr. Kadir, you know, this patient's getting quite sick. The emergency department's calling me and wanting me to admit him into the hospital. You can see his imaging here and it doesn't look great. So you're my ICU attending on. What do you think? I knew you guys were gonna need me. So here I am with my ICU team. This patient has progressed to severely ill on the verge of critically ill. He's had a pretty rapidly escalating O2 requirement. My colleagues have summarized the therapeutics that he should receive. So anybody on oxygen should be started on corticosteroids. This gentleman, given that he's now on high flow oxygen, should be started also on an additional immunomodulator such as tocilizumab or baricitinib. Supportive care, though, is just as important as appropriate medications for COVID-19. And the cornerstone of supportive care for somebody with COVID-19 and worsening respiratory failure is going to be appropriate respiratory support. So the two options you have initially are going to be high-flow nasal cannula, as this patient was started on, or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So there's been a lot of data on both of these modalities in COVID-19, and even prior to COVID-19, these were both supportive modalities that have been studied pretty extensively. So in the high-flow COVID trial and the SOHO COVID trial, high-flow nasal cannula was compared to standard O2. And in both studies, they found that high-flow nasal cannula probably decrease rates of intubation, although the impact on mortality is not clear, not clear that it has really any impact on mortality, but decreased rates of intubation, that is a meaningful patient-centered outcome. So high-flow nasal cannula, definitely part of my toolbox for supportive care in COVID-19. Things get a little bit more complicated when you talk about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So both the Kaviticus and Recovery RS trials compared the use of CPAP to high-flow nasal cannula to standard oxygen. The Kaviticus group had a preset criteria for intubation, um, and that was their outcome, actually, was need for intubation between the three modalities. And in this trial, they found that there was no difference in need for intubation among the three modalities. Recovery, however, um, they because this was a pragmatic trial, and done rapidly in many, many centers, they did not have predefined intubation criteria. They did, however, find that the CPAP group had decreased rates of intubation, but with that also had increased rates of adverse events. And overall, there was no difference or in mortality. So what do we make of all of this? How do we put this all together? Well, both high-flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation likely reduce rates of intubation compared to standard O2. The impact on mortality for both of these is unclear. There are pros and cons of different types of oxygen support. So high-flow nasal cannula 
really has a better safety profile. It's better tolerated than mask, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, very few adverse effects and tolerable for the vast majority of patients. Non-invasive ventilation, there are a lot more nuances to think about. So it's important to note that in both Coviticus and Recovery RS, the group studied CPAP, not BiPAP. So the difference being there's no inspiratory pressure used in CPAP, just positive and expiratory pressure or PEEP. And that's important because the use of inspiratory pressure can result in the generation of large tidal volumes, which can be injurious to patients who are developing ARDS. So if you are going to use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, I would highly recommend that you use CPAP instead of BiPAP, keeping that in mind. Other thoughts in terms of non-invasive ventilation is that while it may provide more support than high-flow nasal cannula, there's a higher potential for adverse effects. We saw in recovery that there were increased rates of adverse effects. So some safety considerations to keep in mind, aside from the tidal volume issues, is that you know, non-invasive ventilation is not going to be nearly as tolerable for as many patients. Patients can find the mask uncomfortable. Um, they, they can result in facial uh, pressure ulcers with prolonged use. They're also not appropriate for use in patients who are at risk of aspiration um, or in patients who have altered mentation. So it really, it's a modality that really should be avoided in a lot of patients who, you know, are at risk for some of the worst outcomes with ARDS. Patients who are older, patients who are more frail, uh, these are going to be your patients who are at higher risk for aspiration. You also want to consider its impact on other aspects of care. One thing I frequently saw during some of the worst of COVID was really prolonged use of non-invasive ventilation. Um, and, you know, that has, this is not a modality that is meant for continuous long-term use. When you have a, have a CPAP mask on somebody for days at a time, it's going to impact other aspects of care, things like nutrition. Um, these patients are often kept NPO while they're on, um, while they're on non-invasive ventilation to minimize risk for aspiration. That's obviously not something that you want to do for days and days at a time. So um, just to summarize, high flow nasal cannula is going to be more tolerable for many more patients. Non-invasive ventilation, it does have a place. It can be useful, but if you are going to use it, it's important to be mindful of all of these caveats and safety considerations. And so what about proning? So awake proning got a lot of, um, got a lot of attention during the worst of the COVID pandemic. So proning in general was best studied prior to the pandemic in intubated patients with ARDS. And it works by essentially impacting the distribution and volume of air in the lungs and helping to ventilate areas that are less well aerated, namely the posterior inferior parts of the lungs. We saw that this had a mortality benefit in intubated patients with ARDS in the PROCEVA trial. In this trial, patients with ARDS and a PETA-F ratio of less than 150 on at least 60% FiO2 were randomized to prone positioning or not prone positioning. There was decreased 28 and 90-day mortality in the proned group. So enter awake proning during COVID. So there were mixed results when this was looked at systematically. It sounds like a great intervention. It's simple. It doesn't necessarily require a lot of specialized equipment. And it sounded appealing for many reasons. However, while it sounds simple and feasible, in reality, it's, it's often not. Um, proning somebody for eight hours a day um, is not an easy feat. And um, patients have to be mobile and be able to be cooperative, meaning not confused, not altered, um, in order for this to have really any likelihood of, of, of success. So there were several negative trials, actually, when proning was looked at systematically, including COVID prone and COVID prone and another pragmatic clinical trials group. And there was actually potential association 
with harm with proning. And again, this might not be intuitive because it sounds very simple. I'm asking a patient to lay on their abdomen for several hours a day, but in reality, again, patients, this, these aren't patients who are at home in their beds. They're con connected to tubes and lines and devices. So there is a risk for adverse events. So while there were several negative trials, there were some positive trials as well. So in these two studies, there was decreased rates of intubation in patients who are prone. Now, you know, why the disparate results? So there are a few things you might notice in both of these sets of trials. So the duration of proning was pretty different. It's most noticeable in the Ibarra Estrada trial, where patients were prone for over nine hours per day on average. In the negative trials, patients were prone for about two to four hours per day on average. And when the nuances of proning have been looked at more carefully, it does seem that the patient's who are most likely to experience success from proning are those who can prone for more than eight hours a day and in those in whom concurrent high flow nasal cannula is being used. So sort of the bottom line is that, you know, proning may be useful, but again, it's only, it's, it's most likely to be useful in patients who can prone for long periods of time. It's not an intervention with without risk. So if you are going to prone somebody who's awake, cooperative, and mobile, you still want to maintain a high level of vigilance for, for these patients because they're, they're certainly not out of the woods. So now let's circle back to our case. So again, this is our same 67-year-old gentleman with multiple comorbidities. You consulted the ICU team when his oxygen requirements were increasing. His peak oxygen requirements ended up being around 40 liters, 40% FiO2. He was awake, cooperative, mobile, and able to prone for several hours a day. So he was proned as well. And he improved over the course of five days and his oxygen requirements came down. He's now back down to room air, setting 99%, not complaining of any shortness of breath. However, he still has a positive COVID test and his PCR values have remained persistently elevated. And this is in spite of the fact that he received five days of remdesivir. And despite the fact that his O2 requirements improved, his symptoms persisted. So what do you do now? This is a scenario we encounter not infrequently and um, one in whom we often require a lot of input from our infectious disease colleagues. So I'm going to kick this question back to Dr. Obuagu. Thank you, Dr. Kadir, and you're absolutely right. That's a frequent consult uh, question we get. And unfortunately, it's uh, kind of uh, an area that we're still learning so much more about uh, around persistent and viral load positivity. And I think um, we, we know some things about its relationship to disease severity and patient outcomes as we'll, as we'll discuss uh, moving forward. Uh, but also uh, viral loads are also important from a transmission standpoint, right? That anyone who, you know, still harbors virus can, can transmit that. And so what we do know is that certain hosts tend to have difficulty clearing the virus and how that would manifest in these hosts are just really prolonged viral shedding. And some of these individuals have very high viral loads as evidenced by having low cycle thresholds on their PCR test. Now, this patient hasn't quite met a prolonged viral shedding yet. He's really only had symptoms for a couple of days, so I won't quite put him in that bucket quite yet. But then we know that prolonged uh, viral shedding can be problematic from a testing standpoint because you have individuals who continue to have a positive test in the hospital, out of the hospital, and it really leaves uh, you know, clinicians and providers scratching their heads as to when you, can, uh, when you need to intervene for these patients. And many times, you know, it's sometimes hard to figure out if they're reinfected or, or have uh, symptoms that are attributable to the virus that would indicate treatment. Um, and very, very confusing picture. And where there's been long periods of times between tests, the question always comes up, was this persistent shedding or did the person get reinfected? And a very pertinent question, era of newer variants that keep emerging that are immune evasive, where reinfection rates have been very well documented. Unfortunately, a lot of this is a data-free zone and um, you know certain nuances around how we review each case to determine what to do. But this is a very frequent scenario.
And so what do we know so far? I mean, again, we've talked about evidence for prolonged viral shedding in individuals. Just pay attention to the fact that some tests are not ways of testing for viability of the virus. It's really important as we don't do viral cultures routinely. Such, for example, PCR tests may reflect, you know, just the presence of viral or viral material that may not necessarily be direct uh, uh, a measure of viral replication, which again correlates with effectivity. But studies have tried to tease out what are the implications of high viral loads versus low viral loads and patient outcomes. You know, some studies have shown higher prevalence of extra pulmonary or, or non-pulmonary organ failure in individuals who have high viral loads, and certainly individuals with critical illness or much more severe end of the spectrum of illness requiring ICU stay have been reported to have higher viral loads compared to those who, who do not experience severe outcomes as well as mortality, and also as some individuals do have a decreased chance of sustained recovery. Now, I will note that for many of the uh, antiviral trials, for example, that viral loads have also not correlated with clinical outcomes. Now, in the active three TICO study group, they looked at baseline characteristics, including viral factors in about 2,500 individuals. And they look at the relationship between antigen level, which again is a kind of a surrogate of you know, amount of virus and prognosis. And they found, similar to what we found with viral loads, that viral load was not a good surrogate for patient outcomes. However, when you had very high plasma antigen levels of 1,000 nanograms per liter or higher, that they were associated with higher odds of worsened uh, pulmonary status. Again, that's a surrogate for having higher amount of virus. And so, you know, these data at least raise the question around, you know, the role of ongoing uh, viral replication in the pathogenesis of hospitalized COVID-19 patients, which has implications for the ap applications of antiviral uh, agents in these hosts. Let's discuss emerging data on approved and new drugs for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. There's a plethora of studies out there that are evaluating multiple agents uh, for COVID-19 therapies. And these tend to fit into three buckets. They tend to be agents that have activity against the virus, um, and then they're immunomodulator therapies as well. And there are also therapies that fit kind of fit in the other category because they have you know different uh, modalities of actions. You know, for example, colchicine. Um, and you know, a question in the field also is if you know not just using single agents, but also you know, is there a role for combination modalities as well to optimize patient outcomes? And I think in context of uh, some of our immune compromised hosts who have difficulty with clearing virus, who experience worse COVID-19 outcomes. I think for that uh, subset of those patients, you know, evaluating therapies in combination may uh, be, be the best way to go. And so here we just highlight a number of agents that have been evaluated. Some of these have shown benefit either for positive clinical outcomes and or mortality and have made it to FDA authorization or approval status, an example being remdesivir and nirmatrelvir ritonavir. And some of these are being evaluated not just as outpatient therapies, but also as inpatient therapies. And we know we would all do well to stay in touch with the literature to figure out what the outcomes of these would be. Multiple immunomodulators also have been evaluated, um, again, some in combination with others. Drugs like dexamethasone, baricitinib, tocilizumab, for example, have shown a benefit and have achieved clear FDA approval for certain patients and for certain unique indications. And there's so many other monoclonal antibodies as well that are being evaluated and more in development that hopefully have a broad activity against some of the newer circulating variants. And of course, everyone's trying to develop drugs that really are not influenced by the changing epidemiology of the virus, but are able to maintain activity in spite is viral evolution that we've observed throughout the pandemic. Uh, platform trials have really been, you know, just such pivotal and just so helpful with identifying uh, therapies, um, evaluating therapies uh, for, for COVID-19. And, you know, some of the uh, uh, platform trials have been really multinational, spread across, you know, low resource, high resource setting. And of course, you know, with the advantage of being a representative of, you know, very different parts of the world. However, we do know that also one of the uh, concerns are just the differential practice patterns and availability of medications and resources that could also influence outcomes independent of uh, drugs that are being studied. 
in this table, we show both investigational agents that are being evaluated, as well as those that have already either been shown to be futile or have a benefit. So for example, the recovery trial led to recognition that dexamethasone, for example, did have a positive benefit as well as tocilizumab. However, other agents have not shown quite the same benefit. The active clinical trials have evaluated a lot of medications, not just antiviral agents, but also addressing certain complications of COVID-19, such as the procoagulant states that many of us know that lead to you know, thromboembolic events, strokes, et cetera, that do occur in individuals with COVID-19. And these, for example, provided excellent data for some of the monoclonal antibodies, and they continue to try to identify immunomodulators that will show benefit for patients and also those that don't work, for example, like lenzilumab. iSpy COVID is another platform trial, again, focusing a lot on immunomodulator therapies because it's really focused on people who have critically ill disease and, you know, lots of um, agents also being evaluated in, in those clinical trials. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, the newer clinical trials are occurring in a very difficult environment because we already have standard of care that includes uh, dexamethasone. We already have standard of care that includes other immunomodulators. So you really need agents that will show a big effect to be able to emerge in this current environment for advancing therapies. Solidarity was a WHO platform trial, again, that evaluated lots of therapies and including remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and again, were very useful, not just in the US, but globally to define therapies that worked and did not work for COVID-19. And I think, you know, this has, in a broader sense, has reflected, you know, um, excellent uh, collaboration between, you know, research institutions, um, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies, biopharmaceutical companies, really just working together in the face of a global pandemic to try to dig up old drugs, uh, come up with new drugs to identify, you know, what works. And I think that um, this approach will serve us well for future uh, pandemics. Thanks for that fantastic summary. It is going to be interesting to see what impact all the research that's been done during COVID-19 and the and and the uh, platform trials specifically, like what impact that's going to have on research going forward, whether it's in the setting of a pandemic or not. In spite of all of the work that's been done, there's still so many unanswered questions, some of which you highlighted. I think one of the more um, challenging scenarios for me is what to do with immunocompromised patients who really have like comprised the majority of my patient population these days and in the last several months. Um, on the one hand, they're the patients who are at highest risk for adverse outcomes from COVID. Um, on the other hand, they're also at high risk for experiencing adverse effects from some of the therapies we use for COVID, namely the immunomodulators. So, you know, I think that's that's like one big unanswered question that remains. I think the impact on non-hospital, non-mortality outcomes also um, is yet to be determined. Like, does does anything that we're doing have an impact on the incidence of long COVID and prolonged symptoms? So those have been some of the questions that have been on my mind and that I think are incredibly important to answer moving forward. And I'm just curious from the two of you, Onima and Charlie, what are some hot topics that you think um, really need to be answered next? Yeah, Dr. Kadir, great questions. Uh, but I'd really like to know is what do we do with patients who keep having positive PCRs um, and who we continually treat with remdesivir and yet they continue to come back positive? I'm never quite sure what to do with these patients. Can we send them home? Do they need to isolate? I can't find beds for them in SNF facilities and that sort of thing. And so I think there needs to be more data in and around this area. And I know it would help uh, help myself and my other fellow hospitalists out with. Because most of the time I'm asking uh, uh, my colleagues like Dr. Obuagu to help us out on this and, and solve this problem. But uh, Dr. Obuagu, what else? What, what's, a, what's of high interest on your mind? <laughs> I wish I had the great answer for your previous question. And I think I alluded to this that, um, you know, we do have patients who have prolonged viral shedding, for example, who we expose antivirals and still una unable to, to clear the virus. And, you know, for instance, we had a, a case where the individual actually developed a resistance mutation that caused uh, 
uh, decreased susceptibility to remdesivir in that context and then cleared eventually with addition of a monoclonal antibody therapy. So I still think for some of the more challenging patients who, you know, have immune deficiencies or both acquired or or innate um, that do cause uh, difficulties with clearing the virus, maybe we, we can better evaluate uh, combination therapies uh, for those individuals. I think some of us also wonder if um, there should be a hard stop for antivirals at some point. Is there a role for much more longer treatments uh, with the goal of viral eradication? We don't use viral endpoints in our treatment strategies. We do focus on clinical outcomes, which are what we like to see. But you know, are there any role for other additional endpoints, you know, for certain patients to ass when, assess when they've received optimum therapy, because, you know, a one-size-fits-all approach with a treatment duration, for example, may not be the appropriate way to manage every, every single uh, uh, patient in, in that context. Just to summarize everything that we have gone through so far, there are many options in your toolkit for caring for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And some things to keep in mind is that SpO2 and oxygen needs are going to be useful for defining the severity of COVID-related illness in hospitalized patients. Treatment guidelines are constantly changing and are readily available from the NIH and WHO, and we urge you to check those websites regularly. Some of the FDA-approved therapeutic options we have for hospitalized patients include remdesivir, baricitinib, tocilizumab, and dexamethasone, and um, new treatment options are continuing to be evaluated. Appropriate oxygen therapy is a foundational component of supportive COVID care. And viral loads, while not good surrogates for disease, may be useful as predictive biomarkers. And I imagine we will learn more about this with time. So thank you everybody for joining us. Please remember to complete the post-test and evaluation form at the link on the screen. And be sure to join us again for more CME with Bonham CE.